Since we last chatted, I have cut way more of my two and a half inch squares for my scrappy Irish chain scrap along. And I heard from some of you that you have been cutting those squares as well. I still have more to go. I think my reds and my oranges are much smaller piles than some of my other colors, but it has given me a great start on cutting those squares. And I've pieced both one block A as well as one block B so I could test out the block pattern and see how everything was going to fit together. Here is block A. This is the scrappiest of the two blocks and it's going to use the majority of your two and a half inch squares. And then we also have block B. And this one is going to showcase your background fabric and it's going to use up just a few more of your scrap squares. If you're new to this channel, stick around. I'm going to show you how to piece these blocks and give you pattern information so you can join in on this fun Scrappy Irish Chain Scrap Along. The quilt pattern that we are using for this Scrappy Irish Chain is this pattern here, Scrappy Irish Chain by Jesse Fincham. The pattern is a free pattern. I have it linked in the description box below. So grab your pattern if you haven't already done so. I've shared a couple videos prior to this one, one about choosing fabrics for scrappy quilts and then another about the cutting specifically for this pattern. So if you've missed those two, go back and watch those and get caught up to date because today we are talking about how to piece these blocks. Now, I'm going to start with block A and show you how I go about putting these blocks together, my steps for piecing and some helpful tips along the way. So let's get started by looking down here at my cutting table, which right now is pretty empty, but you can see I do have my stacks of fabrics. These are the colors that I am using for the most part, so sort of a scrappy rainbow. I'm using all of my own fabrics and just a mix of them from so many different fabric lines. Now, if you grab your pattern, everything you need for piecing is on page two. And I am just going to be following the layout diagram here. These pink squares around the perimeter, so three here, three here, the three here, three here, those are these units right in here. So you're going to need your contrast fabric for those. I am using this dark gray Moda Bella Solid in Etchings Charcoal for those. And then these four white squares, those are your background fabrics. And I am using this cute little, let me grab a square, cute little sketchy print here for my background fabrics. But everything else in this block is going to be your scrappy little two and a half inch squares. First thing I'm going to do is lay my block out. Now I like to plan things a little bit as I make my blocks. So I am going to be laying out my blocks before I stitch them together. You could opt not to do this. If you wanted just to kind of throw all of your two and a half inch scrap squares into a bin and just sort of draw them out at random. You certainly could. You can plan this as much or as little as you want to. That's the fun of scrap quilts. They don't really have any rules or right or wrong ways to do things. It's just using up those scraps out of our scrap bin. So I am a planner, so I am going to go ahead and plan a little bit. Now each block takes 65 two and a half inch scrap squares. And that means I am going to need about eight of each of my different colors here. And I'm using this as one of my colors, just those white colorful, white backgrounds with colorful prints for one of my colors. And I'm gonna need about eight of each of the colors. So I'm gonna keep that in mind as I go and just start laying out according to this diagram. And on the first block that I made, I just grabbed one in each color and then laid those out and then grabbed one of each color again, laid those out and kept going. I'm gonna start laying things out, but then I'm gonna have Ryan add a little zhuzhy music. We're gonna do one of those little fast forward ditties so you don't have to watch me do all of this in slow motion. But sometimes it's kind of fun to see the process of how people lay things out. So we're gonna do it. We're just gonna do it in fast motion once I get going here. 
So I, this first row takes nine squares. So I'm gonna end up probably, I'll go ahead and pull another grouping here. And I'm just doing this so I can keep track of my colors for one thing and for another so that I can make sure that my prints aren't duplicated too soon. I have a lot of colors here, but I know I have more of some prints than of others. Okay, another gray, and we'll pull this one. Okay, and then I do need some of my grays and some of my backgrounds. So we'll just tuck those down here and let's just start going. I started with red in my corner on the last block, so I don't wanna do that again for this one. So I'm just gonna start here and just sort of start laying things out. Make sure you guys can see what's happening. So I can see here we're gonna need three of the prints, the pink is the gray. So we'll do three prints and then we'll do the gray, the background print, another background or another gray print rather, and then three more prints. I don't want those ginghams beside each other. I'm gonna run out of room. Let's move these all up just a hair. And what do I want down here? Maybe we're gonna take this guy down here. So that gives me the first row, and then we'll just start on the second row. And I think about right here is where we're just gonna fast forward things for you so that you don't need to see this all in slow motion, and we'll get this all laid out. So I'll meet you back here after the little fast forward part. Okay, I think I've got it. If you were watching, you saw that I had to fix this little spot down here because I had forgotten to put in my gray squares. I did that the first time when I was laying everything out too. I just got in the, in the groove of putting all of the prints out and I forgot these little guys down here. So do pay attention to your little map as you're going along. And if you want to, um, even like put like a little dot or a little X or something just so that those pink squares don't quite blend in as well with the other scrappy squares, that's going to help you to make sure to, to get those into the right spots. Okay, but I've got everything laid out here. It mostly <laughs> fits on screen here. Gives you a good idea. Now, don't stress out about this too much. I did make a couple changes here and there as I was going to just sort of move colors around or prints around a little bit. But this is a step where you could really just get all in your head about where the prints are going and where the colors are going. And really once this quilt is all put together, all of these prints and colors and fabrics are just gonna kind of blend and um, if you have one fabric, like my reds, 
these bright reds are the ones that I notice the most. So those are the ones I do want to make sure that I have spread out nicely throughout the block. So maybe you're going to find you have a specific color, a bright red, or maybe a navy, or something like that that really jumps out in comparison to your other colors. Make sure you spread those out throughout your block, but don't worry about it too much. In a quilt like this, when we have so many colors and so many scraps, it really does tend to just sort of blend together nicely once everything is put together. The next thing that we need to do is to start sewing together these rows. I am sewing them together in long vertical rows and I am pressing them a little bit differently than what the pattern calls for. I wanted to be able to, where are my other, here's my block. I wanted to be able to rotate these blocks when I am putting everything together. So I wanna be able to take this block and know that no matter which way I turn it, it is going to fit together with this block no matter which way I turn this block. So I pressed my seams so I could do that. And that's gonna give me a little bit more flexibility when I start putting everything together. I won't need to worry about making sure my block is rotated a certain direction so that my seams nest. So what I did, I'm gonna lay this here in the middle of the screen, is I, as I'm pressing, as I sew together this row, these seams are all going to get pressed towards this white square right here, your background square. In your second row, your seams are going to get pressed away from the center. So this is your center square here, so these seams are going to get pressed this direction, and these seams will get pressed this direction. The third row gets pressed the same as row number one. This is your center square here. These are gonna get pressed away, pressed away. The fourth row gets pressed the same as the second row. So all odd rows are pressed the same and all even rows are pressed the same. And we're just alternating pressing towards that center square and pressing away from that center square. That means all of these rows, as you sew them together, are going to nest. And then your final seams, once you have all of your rows sewn together, that those final seams are going to get pressed towards the center. So you're gonna press these this direction and these this direction. And I'm going to show you the back of the block once I have it pieced together so you can see how that looks. Um, it comes together really nicely and all of the seams nest really nicely as you're sewing them together. So that's going to be my approach for the pressing. And I wanted to show you too how I'm going to gather up all of these squares and get them over to my sewing machine. You might have a method that you like doing for keeping things organized. I know I have done this a number of different ways over the years. So this is the method I am currently using. I've been doing it this way for a while. Um, usually I'm doing this maybe when I'm sewing together blocks in, in the final rows for a quilt because I don't want them to get shifted around. I have tried doing different methods, taking a picture, stacking things just so, and inevitably at some point in time, things get a little bit switched around and don't, don't end up where I want them to be. So I started using this method and it's just worked really well for me. And what I will do, I have Wonder Clips with alpha bitties. Now you could use uh, post-its and pins if you wanted to. Uh, I happen to have alpha bitties the little numbers and wonder clips on hand. So this is what I use. I'm going to use these to number my rows and I'm gonna pin everything before I take it over to the machine. Uh, this allows me to not only keep everything in order, but then it means I can just sit at my sewing machine once everything is pinned and just chain piece, chain piece, chain piece until all of the vertical rows are sewn together. So uh, I find it to be very, um, time saving, a little bit more time consuming to get everything set up, but um, I think you'll see how this is going to work. So the first thing we do is just pin all of these squares together in their rows. And I am pinning these not too um, fancily, I'm just pinning them just to keep them in the right order. So I'm doing right sides together, which means once I get over to my machine, I can just give them a little unpin, realign, and keep sewing. And I will do this for all of these rows. I'm going to show you this first one along with how I label the row then at the top. 
and then we'll do one of those little fast forwardy numbers again <laughs> so you don't have to watch all of this again but sometimes it's nice just to have a little different perspective on how we can sort things for sewing or um, you know give us a, a little bit of a different idea how to keep things orderly I know I'm not alone in sometimes having my blocks get a little bit out of hand out of order when I'm sewing them so then I would just put the number one right up there at the top I know that my one needs to be at the top when I'm sewing the rows together I just leave that alpha bitty in place as I'm sewing as I'm pressing so all of my rows stayed numbered the whole time and then I just repeat with the next one and here's where we're going to speed this up a little bit for you guys and then you'll see how this is going to look once I have it all completed. portion because Tigsy decided he needed to say hi. We almost made it through that part without him visiting, but <laughs> the lure of the cutting table was just too much for him. I know some of you had been wanting to see him again, so here he is. He sees his tail in that monitor. I have a monitor right there, and he can see himself from the camera up above me, and that's what catches his attention. He's going to go mess up my, oh, yep, <laughs> messing up my squares. Getting everything all out of position. Tigsy, you're gonna have to move. We're gonna move him out of the way. I'm gonna finish this one last bit. There we go. Finish this one last bit, and then we'll move on to the next step. And I'm back from pinning those together and I grabbed one thing. Um, some of you have seen those design boards. I'm sure they can be fancy. You can make your own. I wanted something similar, but I didn't want to take the time to make mine fancy. So this is actually one of those little magazine boards. There's comic book boards and magazine boards. And this is a the magazine ones are just a little bit bigger. This is eight and a half by 11 and it's just a little bit card stocky. And to the other side of it, I glued a piece of batting to the front of it. So it works as a design board, but it was so easy. I just used Elmer glue all and just glued it right on top. And I like using these the same way you would use a design board. It's not as big as some of them, but it was really easy to make. So I use this and I would just like stack all of these little guys on here. Sometimes I'll even use an old cardboard bolt, like the, the bolt that's left over after you use your whole bolt of fabric, those cardboard pieces. I'm surprised I don't have one laying around here. Oh, hey Ryan, hand me that. I've got one behind the camera. One of these guys, sometimes I save these, and so sometimes I'll use these to transport pieces to and from my cutting table over to my sewing, my sewing machine. And I have a little cart in my sewing room too that sometimes I will stack things in and then use that to transport. I'm a big fan of using whatever I have on hand. If I have something that looks like it's going to do the trick, I will use that. And this is just an easy way to stack all of these up. 
they're gonna stay put. I'm just gonna walk over to the sewing machine. I'm going to show you just briefly how I sew these together now that I have everything pinned, um, just to give you an idea of what I was talking about. So I'm gonna meet you right over there. Okay, I am ready to start sewing here at my machine. I have my stack of strips over here and I've just picked one up. I'll take my pin out, readjust so that everything is lined up nicely and then I'll be ready to sew. Now I have all my strips setting here on my sewing machine bed. Normally I would set those to the left of my machine so I have a little more space, but I wanted them to be right there close by so you could see a little bit better. When I'm sewing these, I don't worry about which particular squares I'm sewing together. I know that once all of the pins are removed, everything has been sewn. And because I have all of my rows marked with those wonder clips, I don't have to keep anything in a certain order. And so I will just do all of these that same way. Those clips do add a little bit of weight to the strips as you hold them. You don't want to just willy nilly wave these around because you could lose a clip and a number. That's happened to me before. You do have to be a little bit careful to them, a little bit careful with them so that you don't lose those. But I think this, this just means I can sit here during this part of the sewing and I don't need to think about anything. I can just sew. I'll do all nine of these, just like I'm doing right now, and then snip my little sections apart and repeat until everything has been sewn together. It's really nice if you have a podcast you're listening to. Sometimes we have to think a lot about what we're sewing, but this is one time we can just sort of sew without having to think too much, <laughs> which is a welcome change depending on the projects that you're currently working on. Some of those are just tricky and require full attention. One more, and then we'll snip those all apart. Slide that to the side. I don't know if you can hear Tigsy in the background, but he is determined he's going to get that monitor. If you hear scuffling back there, that's what that is. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do, this is the Clover Pendant Thread Clipper, and I really like using this for snipping apart my chain piecing. There's lots of different things you can use to do this, but I've had one of these for a few years, and it's my current favorite. I'll just bring these all up. Usually I would do this on my lap, but I don't think you'll be able to see there. And then I just snip these all apart. And then I'm ready to do more of the exact same of what I just did. I left that last one still attached. And then we just repeat and keep going until we have no more pins left. So I'll just grab another spot and keep going. So I'm just gonna sew these all together. I'll meet you back once I've sewn everything for these and pressed them. because I wanna show you how they're going to look pressed. So I'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> what are you doing? All right, my strips are all sewn and pressed, and let's take a look at the pressing on them. So as you can see, I have left the numbers attached to each row, which makes it so nice when laying everything out. My odd rows are pressed towards the center, towards that center square. My even rows are pressed in the opposite direction, away from that center square. And then as you sew those strips together, those seams are all going to nest nicely for you. Once you have everything sewn together here, those seams are gonna also get pressed towards the center. So this way and this way when you are pressing those seams. I'm gonna pull down the block behind me here, show you how that looks on the back. So here we go. You can see that 
these seams here are all pressed towards the center and these seams are all pressed towards the center. And that's exactly how I'm going to do this block as well. Now, let me gather up these strips off of my cutting table and pull the B block down. This is the A block. We need 13 of these. And then we need 12 of the B block, this block back here. And actually, I'll put this back up again one more time so you can see how that's going to fit together. Well, let me pivot that so those prints aren't touching. There we go. You can see how those prints are gonna create the pattern with the A block and the B block. That's going to be really pretty. I wanted you guys to be able to see how those two blocks work together. Okay, I'll leave there's those there for just a minute. Pick up these strips. And I like to leave these on as long as possible when I'm sewing these together. So just something to keep in mind when you start sewing those long strips together. The longer you keep them labeled, the less you have to think about what goes where. All right. Let's pull this one down here. This is the B block. This is the one we need 12 of. This block is going to use 12 of your scrappy two and a half inch squares. And then it's going to use some of your bigger background pieces. My block got wrinkly as I was pressing those strips because I had that crazy Tiggs laying on my cutting table just crunched up on this block. So it was pressed nicely not that long ago, but it has a nice wrinkle on it now from that crazy boy. Okay, so I'm not going to walk through all of the individual steps as I did with the A block because it's going to feel pretty much the same. We are going to be sewing in vertical strips and you have more of those background fabrics. You can see your layout here at the bottom of page two. And I changed the pressing on this one, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video. So instead of pressing, you can see up here on A, we press the first strips towards the center. On the B block, we're gonna press that first strip away from the center, towards the center, away from the center. And then the same on the opposite side, away, towards, away. And then the final seams get pressed away from the center on this B block. Let me flip this over so you can see that pressing. So you can see we're pressing away from the center here, towards the center, away from the center, repeating that on the opposite side, and then the final seams get pressed away from the center. And that makes your B block. So between those two blocks, those are going to compose our scrappy Irish chain and it's going to allow us to really use up a lot of our scraps. I am going to continue making A, bo a blocks and B blocks throughout the upcoming months. I don't know how quickly I'm going to be able to work on them. They do take a fair amount of time, um, but they are such a fun way to use up those scraps. And then I will be popping in periodically to share my progress, along with maybe some other fun scrap busting tips or scrap busting patterns that I come across as we go through 2023. So I would love to hear if you're participating in the Scrappy Irish Chain Scrap Along. And if you're doing it really scrappy, planned scrappy, or maybe you are going with one of those pre-cut options I mentioned in the previous video. In any event, have a great time sewing and I will catch you again next time.